Okay, whenever you're ready to start recording. Great. Um, so thank you all for joining us for the final uh, Grand Rounds uh, session this fall um, and for sticking with us for this long. We were just talking about uh, how long of a semester this has been with no breaks and lots of Zoom time. Um, I am thrilled to welcome uh, Dr. Annalisa Packham, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Economics, to give her talk today, The Blessing of Leisure or the Curse of Unemployment, Effects of Unemployment Insurance Duration on Health. Um, and I'll let you take it away. Okay, thank you all so much for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to present this work. And in particular, this is work that is new, a new working paper with Alexander A. Hammer. He is an assistant professor at Johannes Kepler University in Linz, Austria. And the question that we're really interested in asking in this work is how does unemployment insurance duration affect physical and mental health for workers? And I think that this is really important because it's gonna be building on a larger literature in economics, which has already well established the fact that by extending unemployment insurance duration, this also leads to extended unemployment duration, meaning that when you extend benefits for workers, they spend longer out of the workforce. This is what economists typically call as a moral hazard problem, meaning that it's inefficient that workers will, will stay out of the labor force until the point of exhaustion. However, other people have pointed out that this isn't necessarily inefficient if it leads to better job match. Better in the sense that it's a higher paying job, or a job that more is more suited to a worker's skill set. We're going to extend this by thinking about how this time spent out of the labor force could also lead to additional effects on mental and physical health for workers. And in doing so, we're going to be thinking about how also this better job match leading to maybe higher wages or a match to a less physically demanding job could affect workers' health. And so that's a big question that we're really interested in answering in this particular paper. And in particular, we're going to be analyzing the effects of an extension in UI benefits by nine weeks and looking at the effects on hospitalizations, prescriptions, and disability claims for upper Austrian workers. And we're also going to be able to extend that analysis to look at their children as well. And if you're asking yourself, well, why should we care about Upper Austria or why are you not looking at the US? There are several reasons why this actually is going to serve us pretty well in doing this analysis. So in particular, the policy environment in Austria is gonna provide us a nice natural experiment to analyze these effects in a causal way. So in particular, we're gonna exploit a policy change or a policy cutoff in Austria where workers over the age of 40 are eligible for an extension in UI benefits that workers that are laid off under that age cutoff are not eligible for. This is also going to be a nice environment to study. This context is going to provide us linked data for workers and their health outcomes. So that means that we're going to be able to look at health outcomes and track a worker across their lifetime or in case of our, our sample selection across the years that we have data for. And we're also going to be able to match that to their children. And that's something that is very hard or nearly impossible to do with existing US data. This is also going to be a setting where workers don't lose their health insurance when they lose their jobs. So instead of having a job shock and a health insurance shock at the same time, we're only going to be thinking about the extension and UI benefit duration as a shock and not also this effect on health insurance. So it's going to allow us to say something about their health in the context of this more generous social safety net system. And I think Austria is also going to provide us a nice way to speak to a number of OECD countries because unlike say Scandinavia, Austria is going to track more similarly with work and household behavior to the US. So the way that we're gonna do this is we're gonna exploit that policy that I mentioned earlier where in Austria, workers that are over the age of 40 and lose their jobs get an additional nine weeks of unemployment insurance benefits. And so we're essentially going to be comparing unemployed workers that are just eligible for this extension and benefits to other unemployed workers that are ineligible for this benefit extension. And in doing so, we're going to build on this American Economic Review paper from 2017 that also shows that this greater UI duration, this additional nine weeks of benefits, does lead to longer time spent unemployed. 
And this paper also shows that that additional time spent unemployed leads to a better job match, meaning that workers are going to experience higher wages as a result. We're going to build on this by looking at employment and job match by gender. So we don't want to just get effects for all workers. We want to see how that's going to be changing for male and female workers separately. We're also going to expand on this and provide some new context for this literature by showing effects for mental and physical health. So typically the unemployment insurance literature really focuses a lot on this question of unemployment, time spent unemployed, job search time and wages. We're going to be able to go beyond that and say, okay, if job match does improve, if wages do improve, if people do spend longer out of the, the, the workforce, then what does that do to their physical and mental health? And what does that do for their children? I think this is especially important in this context because most papers that look at job loss and plant closures focus only on men or male workers. We're gonna be going beyond that by really being able to speak to women and their children, which is often omitted from the literature. And I think this is also important because again, this is a setting where job loss is not a result of macroeconomic shifts. So this is not just looking at recession effects. This isn't just looking at an entire plant closure, like a steel plant closing in a particular area. This is just going to be workers living their everyday lives, but facing a job loss shock and then responding to their unemployment insurance benefits. To give you a little preview of where we're heading, we do find similar to other papers that extending UI benefit duration does lead to longer time spent unemployed. But we're going to go beyond that by showing that this does vary based on gender. So for example, we find that female workers spend about four times longer looking for their next job as compared to male workers. And this is going to also be mirrored in their differences in their health effects and their wage effects as well. So in particular, we find that eligible women compared to just ineligible women, so those women, that is, that get that additional nine weeks of benefits, we see that they have an increase in their wages. They're also less likely to match to a physically demanding job, which we are going to posit is the reason for this reduction in opioid prescriptions and antidepressant prescriptions that we see. And we also see in the longer term, they're less likely to eventually claim disability. So we're going to argue that there's some evidence of uh, these positive health spillovers, and we are also going to see some of these positive health spillers, spillovers uh, mirrored within the household because we see effects on their children as well. Now, alternatively, for male workers, we don't see these same kind of positive effects that we see for female workers. In fact, we actually see that extended UI benefits increases cardiac events and increases disability claims in the long run. And I'm going to talk a lot in this presentation about what we think about these results and kind of explore potential mechanisms. Overall, for both genders, these effects are really driven by low income workers uh, and low education workers, so workers that haven't gone to college and workers with children. I think that these findings are going to have some important policy implications, not just for the optimal amount of UI benefit duration, but also in light of the fact that many countries right now are trying to decide what they want to do with UI benefit generosity and duration in light of the pandemic. I think this is also going to have important policy implications when we think about the fact that right now female labor force participation is changing, coming off from a record high rate of females being in the labor force. And if they are responding differently to optimal amounts of UI benefits or to particular amounts of UI benefit duration, then that might may say something about how we can get female workers to match to better jobs and potentially reduce some of the female male wage gender gap. So one question that might already be swimming around in your heads is why should we expect UI to be a positive shock for women in terms of health, but not for male workers? So there's one possibility here that by allowing women to spend longer looking for this other job, you're also providing additional time of leisure while replacing some of their wages. So if women are quote unquote overworked, then by providing additional leisure time, you're allowing them to kind of feel less stressed particularly uh, women that are taking on more in the household than their partners. This is mirrored in the fact that, again, female labor force participation in Austria and other developed countries has been rate rising for the past several decades. 
And also due to the fact that women report doing more household chores and childcare, even in light of working more hours at their jobs. So if female workers are overworked by extending their benefits by nine weeks, even if they don't take up the full amount of benefits, their time constraints are being relaxed a little bit. So it might just be the case that um, if female workers are overworked or overstressed, this leisure could lead to healthier behaviors. On the other hand, there's a lot of work showing that for male workers or for men in particular, more leisure time or conditional cash transfers that provide men income without increasing their amount of time spent working does lead to riskier behavior. So it's possible that these cardiac events are due to male workers taking this additional nine weeks and uh, spending that money or their time on things like smoking or simply just being stressed out at not finding another job right away. Another possibility that, you know, I'll spend a lot of time talking about later is that if women are matching to this higher paying job, then there is an income effect, right? So women are now better able to invest in the health for themselves and for their children. And their wage trajectory is going to be higher in perpetuity. So we can imagine too, that that's going to play into potential reductions in say depression or anxiety and stress. And I'm gonna show you some evidence to actually support both of these ideas. So where I'm headed today in this talk is I wanna first present our estimated effects of UI duration on mental and physical health. I wanna explore some of these potential mechanisms that I've briefly mentioned. And then I am looking forward to some feedback at the end. I would love to hear any potential alternative explanations you might have, or just get kind of a general sense on what you think of the hypotheses or, or the believability of, of our results. So I want to start with a little bit of background here on unemployment insurance in Austria. And this is going to look really similar to US unemployment insurance. It's a compulsory insurance with a 6% payroll tax. Applicants, of course, must be willing to say that they're going to go retraining or, or find a new job. And the benefits formula is calculated relative to previous earnings. So it's about 55% for most people. So the average is between 55 and 60% of the replacement rate. For some families, it can be up to 80% if you're very low income and have provided uh, proof of hardship. Now, this is a really critical part of our analysis here, the cutoffs of the duration of unemployment insurance based on age and experience. So if you are brand new to the labor force and you lose your job in Austria, then you get 20 weeks of unemployment insurance at that 55% replacement rate. If you've worked more than three out of the five of the last years, that's what we're gonna call an experience criterion, then you get 30 weeks. So we're really thinking most of the workers that we're seeing at this age range are uh, getting that 30 weeks. So they've worked three years. Now, if you're above age 40 and you've worked more than six out of the last of the 10 years, then you get an additional nine weeks of benefits. So you're eligible for 39 weeks of benefits. And so that is going to be the cutoff we're really gonna care about a lot for our analysis. So we're essentially comparing workers that are getting 39 weeks that are younger than age 40 and workers that are above age 40 and are getting that 39 weeks. And we're only gonna consider here workers that meet the experience criterion. For those that don't, we'll use them as a placebo check later. But there is an additional cutoff we see here. Above age 50, you get a year of unemployment insurance benefits. This isn't actually a very binding cutoff, so we're not gonna use that cutoff for this analysis. We're only looking at workers aged 30 to 50. So we don't wanna include that second cutoff. We're just gonna use workers below that. And so just workers that are aged 10 years on either side of that age 40 cutoff. Importantly, there's no incentive for firms to hire or fire around these cutoffs. So the firm doesn't benefit at all if they wait, say, until you turn 40 years old to lay you off. If they're going to lay you off and you're age 39, there's no reason for them to give a second thought to do that. And I also want to highlight here again that these workers are not losing their health insurance. So everyone is covered under the universal health care program there. And so everyone is keeping their health insurance at job loss. Now the data that we are going to use is kind of a novel administrative data set. So we're gonna be able to look at the universe of unemployment and spell, uh, spells in Upper Austria. This is gonna cover 11 years spanning 2003 to 2013. And it's gonna contain information about the worker, including their age, their gender, 
their residence, their unemployment date, and all of those are pretty critical for our analysis. Again, we're going to be focusing on workers that meet that experience criterion and are between ages 30 through 50. Now, the part that's pretty new in this uh, in this literature is that we're going to be linking this to data on health and prescription take up. So this is going to be this is going to include prescription data with the names and doses of every medication. It's important to note here that in Austria, prescriptions are not allowed to be refilled. So anytime somebody goes to get a prescription, we're going to see that in our data. It's also important to note here that in Austria, even medications that are like Tylenol, so even low grade, what we would normally consider as an over the counter medication here in the United States can be given a prescription. So we even do pick up even kind of more low grade or what we would consider OTC medications here in our data. So we aren't gonna actually get any information on sales of prescriptions. If, you know, if, if an individual goes to the drugstore and just buys something off the counter, uh, we're not going to be able to pick that up, but we will see quite a lot of information here contained in our prescription data. We Dr. also have information. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I, I, don't, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I think we have a clarifying question. Oh, sure. Uh, Jake, do you have, uh, ah, there we go. Uh, so Camelia has a, a question. Uh -huh. Oh. I'm so sorry, I, I did not, I think I pushed something by mistake. My apologies. No problem. Oh, okay. My apologies, thank you. Okay, no worries. Um, all right, so we are going to also be able to look at hospitalization and doctor's visits. And we're also going to know what an individual is visiting the doctor for, so whether it was a curative treatment or a preventative screening. We're gonna have information on disability claims. I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. And again, importantly, we're gonna be able to link this health data to a worker's child to see what their health outcomes are going to look like as well. And so the methodology that we're gonna use is one that I hinted at before. We call this a regression discontinuity approach where our main variable of interest is this variable UI extend. And that's gonna be equal to one if a worker is at least 40 years old because that is our eligibility cutoff and it's gonna be equal to zero otherwise. We're also gonna control for month, year fixed effects. The reason there is because our panel is spread over quite a few number of years, we wanna make sure we're not just picking up seasonal trends in either health or unemployment. And so again, the health outcomes are those that I mentioned earlier, prescriptions. We're also gonna look at certain types of hospitalization. So those for cardiac events, for example, uh, and substance abuse treatment, I'll talk about a little bit as well. We are gonna use quadratic fits here. If that's not quite your jam, don't worry. I'm gonna show you a little bit later that our results are pretty robust to different types of fits as well. We're gonna be focusing on effects within nine months of job layoff because that's gonna be corresponding to that 39 potential weeks of unemployment insurance. So importantly, when you're thinking about looking at, okay, if an employer lays off a worker and now they're eligible for this additional amount of benefits, then what's going to happen to your health? You kind of have to choose, you know, do they take up opioids in X number of months or X number of years? We did nine months as a way of, of picking a range that kind of made sense to us, but I'm going to show you some effects for other time spans as well, if uh, you're not a big fan of that approach. So importantly, our identification is really going to hinge on the assumption here that no other policy changes or related events are occurring at that same age cutoff. What that means is that there's nothing weird or different about that age cutoff. The only thing that's changing is the eligibility. So that means that workers that are laid off at age 39 and workers that are laid off at age 40 should look exactly the same, except for the fact that the person laid off at age 40 is now getting nine weeks of benefits. And even within gender, we're gonna be comparing just eligible to just ineligible workers. So you can think of this as a local average treatment effect. Just to give a more intuitive example to really hammer this home, I just wanna show you here, if our data, for example, only was comprised of these two workers, Maria and Elizabeth, and Maria was unemployed at age 39, and Elizabeth was unemployed at age 40, any discontinuity at that age cutoff and outcome should be due just to the 
extension and benefits and nothing else. So again, both of these workers have become unemployed. I'm not comparing unemployed workers to other employed workers. I'm only comparing those who are both unemployed and Elizabeth's getting that additional benefit. It doesn't necessarily mean, I should add, that Elizabeth is going to take up the full nine weeks of benefits. It only means she has the potential ability to stay out of the labor force and have her wages become uh, some amount of benefits during that time. So again, I want to mention that our benefit duration, the amount of benefits that individuals take up, does, in, does change differentially by gender. So again, female workers are about four times more likely to or stay out of the labor force four additional days as compared to male workers. If we look at duration across different definitions here, so column one here is benefit duration, column two is unemployment duration, and that just means any time spent out of the, the labor force. Column three is non-employment duration, which is conditional on finding a new job, or we can think of that as the time spent on looking for another job. But we see that across all columns, female workers have a longer time that they spend out of the labor force. So they spend 35 additional days searching for a job, just being eligible again for those additional nine weeks of benefits. Whereas male workers spend about two additional days on um, it. We said before, this might not be a big deal if we care about job match. And what we find is that extending UI benefits does actually improve wages for female workers, but not for male workers. Now, this is a big contribution to the literature here because so far when we just look at all workers, generally papers have found that in Austria, this benefit extension does increase wages. But what we're finding is that really this is only increasing wages for the female workers and not for male workers overall. If we dig a little deeper into this and ask ourselves, well, who is actually getting the benefits? Is it related to the time they spend searching for a new job? What we find is that for female workers, pretty much across the board, uh, no matter how much of the benefit extension they take up, we're still seeing some gains in their wages. But for male workers, interestingly, column four here, what we see is that Male workers taking over 94 days to search for a new job are actually seeing wage losses, which might say something about either the stress and anxiety or pressure to find a new job once you've reached that point, or the fact that once these male workers have this additional nine weeks of benefits, maybe they spend too much time kind of in leisure or engaged in other activities and, and aren't doing serious of a job search as a result. Another important result we find here is that female workers who had a job with hardship before, these are occupational codes that indicate a physically demanding job, a job where you'd be lifting heavy things or be on your feet for hours at a time. We find that female workers, when given the extension and UI benefits, not only find a job that's higher paying, but find a job that's less physically demanding. This isn't actually true for male workers. We find that male workers, again, they don't see increases in wages and might actually be more likely to fill a physically demanding job, which could suggest what might be happening with marginal workers here when female workers are leaving these physically demanded jobs, male workers are filling them. And so just to recap our labor market effects here, we find that UI benefit duration extensions do increase the time spent searching for another job. And even if these workers don't take up the full amount of the benefit extension, they still spend longer searching for a job. For female workers, this is gonna have positive effects on their wages and it's gonna reduce the likelihood that they match to a physically demanding job, which might say something about their propensity to find a new job that's less physically painful as well. So, at this point, you might have several questions about our identification strategy, or you might be wondering a few things that could, uh, so to speak, mess up what we're, we're finding here, or you could find an alternative explanation for some of our results. So we could be asking the question, well, maybe workers are just more likely to be laid off right above the age threshold. And so these workers aren't really the same as workers who are laid off at age 39. But we don't actually see any discontinuity at the age cutoff and firms propensity to hire or fire around those cutoffs. So it does seem that, again, firms don't kind of strategically play that age cutoff. 
Again, you could also be worried that other related events are driving these differences around that age cutoff. Um, so we, I wanna mention here, we don't see any other policies that are changing at that age 40 cutoff. There's no other safety net or any other related programs in Austria at that particular cutoff. I'll say that also when we look at characteristics of these workers, we don't see any major differences around the cutoff. So, you know, workers laid off over the age of 40 aren't any more educated, or it's not that we're getting this bunching of particularly female workers who are laid off above that cutoff. So these workers, we are trying to compare apples to apples here, and these are going to look very similar across the cutoff. Now, one of the other criticisms you might be thinking of here is, well, this treatment seems kind of small. So I just told you that female workers spend 35 additional days looking for a job, but that's only when they're granted benefits for nine weeks. And so if, if you're given an additional nine weeks of benefits, you think that people would spend that time searching for a new job. But what I wanna mention here is that only about 2% of workers actually exhaust the full amount of unemployment insurance benefits. Most workers wanna get back to work as soon as possible so that they can start earning their full wages and not that replacement wage rate. So few workers are gonna exhaust benefits and you might be thinking, well, then why would we expect to find effects at all? And one of the things I wanna really emphasize here is that even though this treatment might seem small, just having the ability to take on that benefit for an additional nine weeks does seem to be changing job search behavior, does seem to be changing where female workers are matching to jobs. And importantly, there's other work showing that there are lasting effects on unemployment and wages. There's also similar effects showing that job displacement and in particular UI benefit generosity does affect things like smoking and stress. And so if we think that even these small nudges are essentially getting workers to change their behavior in a way that meaningfully impacts their health, then I think that our findings are right in line with what you would expect. So I think this is important because it can really inform how just small policy changes can create large shifts in overall health. If these workers aren't even taking up the nine weeks of benefits or only a small proportion of them are, then it's not very costly for governments to allow this extension in benefits because essentially they're not going to end up paying those benefits out in the end. So I wanna spend a good chunk of this talk now turning our attention to the effects that we find on health and risky behavior. And in particular, I wanna start with effects on prescribing behavior. I'm gonna be showing effects by female manner separately. And again, we're gonna be focusing on effects within nine months of job loss, but then seeing how those estimates are gonna change over time. So I'm gonna start by analyzing effects on opioids and then I'm going to turn my attention to other non-opioid medications and look at antidepressants as well. So we might expect opioid prescriptions to change here if females are matching to those less physically demanding jobs. And indeed what we find is no effect for male workers, but a reduction in opioid prescriptions for female workers that accounts for about 17%. And so what this corresponds to is about 500 fewer opioid prescriptions for female workers per year. If you're looking at this graph and you're not a big fan of these two points here, I'll mention that when we bin our estimates by, or when we bin our data by different amounts, this is a little bit spurious here, but kind of is more mitigated in our other graphs. Either way, our lines are fitting the underlying data and this estimate is gonna be very robust under a ton of different specifications. So what we think is going on here is that these female workers that are working in these physically demanding jobs might just be using opioids to get through the workday. Opioids are much more commonly prescribed for work-related pain in Austria than uh, other countries. And this is, I think, really important for the potential of these drugs to become addictive in the long term. There's also evidence already that opioids could potentially be helping workers stay on the job. And so if these female workers are matching to less strenuous jobs, it makes sense then that they would also be reducing the amount of opioid prescriptions that they're using. And in particular, this uh, table here is showing even additional evidence for this idea because what we do is we separate out opioid potency into low and high potency opioids. Our effect is completely concentrated for the reduction in low potency opioids. So these are opioids workers would be more likely to use on the job as compared to high potency opioids, which would be say getting over some sort of traumatic injury or accident. Now, if you want to know whether or not these workers are actually in less pain or if they're just changing their 
prescription dosage or, or potency, then we can also look at other pain medications. So again, in Austria, it's not uncommon for workers to fill out, say, Tylenol prescriptions with the doctor instead of just buying it over the counter at a supermarket. So in general, we don't see any average decrease in non-opioid pain meds, but we do see actually short-term substitution where workers are moving from using opioids after job loss to increasing non-opioid pain medications. And so I think, again, this has some implications for pain that female workers in particular are experiencing on the job. Now, if we turn our attention to mental health, I'm gonna focus here on antidepressants because this is a more commonly um, prescribed type of prescription in, in Austria for workers who are experiencing either anxiety or depression. What we see is that when female workers are granted an additional nine weeks of UI benefits, antidepressant prescriptions fall by about 9%. Now, if we look at whether or not these effects are actually short or long lived, we can also just look at the effects three to 18 months after employment to see which of these prescription reductions are just short term or whether they persist into the female workers next job. So here, what we see is that both opioid and antidepressant effects persist even 18 months later, which suggests that when female workers are matching to this new job, they are less reliant on opioid and antidepressant prescriptions, which potentially is suggesting something as a reduction in pain and, and also maybe a reduction in depression as well. We see a substitution, as I mentioned earlier, to non-opioid painkillers, but only in the first six months after individuals are switching from opioids to these other types of prescriptions. So to recap here, what we see is that extending UI duration by nine weeks decreases opioid and antidepressant prescriptions for female workers. We don't see this similar change for male workers. If we look at who is most impacted by this UI extension, we can separate this out by characteristics for female and male workers. What we see is that effects are even larger in terms of the reduction in opioids and antidepressant prescriptions for parents, workers without college degree, and workers in physically demanding occupations. So again, this could be saying something about these workers in physically demanding occupations using opioids to kind of get through the, their day on the job. And then once they're able to match to a higher paying, less physically demanding job, they're less reliant on these opioid prescriptions. Now I wanna to turn to healthcare utilization. So thinking in particular on inpatient stays, preventative screenings, physician visits, and particular types of cardiac, uh, of inpatient stays that might be relevant to stress or other behaviors. So we're gonna also look at cardiac events. In general, we don't find much on inpatient stays or hospitalizations or screenings. So this extension in benefits doesn't seem to have an overall average effect on healthcare utilization. What we do find though, is when we look at children of these unemployed workers, we see some evidence that female workers invest more in the healthcare of their children. And in particular, their young children when they have potentially more leisure time or more income. So what we see is a reduction in healthcare expenditures for children under the age of six by about 30%, which is driven by lower physician expenditures for curative treatment. So it does seem that there's some evidence that for young children, granting this UI benefit extension can lead to healthier behaviors for these kids. Now I wanna dig a little bit further into specific types of hospitalizations here because I think this overall zero effect might be masking really important heterogeneity in types of illnesses that we think might be most related to job loss or most related to conditional cash transfers in general. So there's existing literature that job loss leads to stress and that unemployment insurance benefits in particular, UI benefit generosity leads to additional smoking behavior. So if that's the case, we can expect that heart conditions in particular might be changing for these workers who are granted extensions and UI benefits. So we're gonna look at heart attacks and strokes to kind of suss out whether or not we see any effects on these most likely to be affected outcomes. 
And what we see here is there doesn't seem to be a big discontinuity for female workers, but the, the diamonds here, which represent our male workers, we do see, seem to see an increase in cardiac events. And when we estimate that, what we see is an increase in cardiac events defined as heart attacks and strokes by about 33%. Now this is off a relatively low baseline. So that's gonna to correspond to about 134 cardiac events per year. So those are, again, those are hospitalizations for these particular events. Now, if you wanna think more about the magnitudes and whether or not that makes sense, I will say that it's not entirely implausible that this is driven by increases in stress or smoking. And just following the literature and what we know from job loss and smoking behavior for male workers, other papers have estimated that job loss leads to about 6% increase in daily smoking for unemployed workers. So this is important in the context of Austria, which ranks fourth in smoking for developed nations and is first for teen smoking. So smoking is a fairly large part of the culture and could be really relevant if we think that these other European, these other papers that look at European job displacement for workers are mirrored here in our findings. So if 6% of our sample did start smoking, as is estimated in the literature, that would correspond to about 70 heart attacks over five years, just using estimates from the medical literature, which could account for about 83% of our estimates. So it's not entirely crazy to think that based on the fact that these workers are experiencing additional stress when given additional benefits, maybe they have increased pressure or they're using their transfer to engage in more risky behavior, that this would lead to an increase in cardiac events. We also see increases in prescriptions for things like beta blockers. So again, an increase in smoking, or you could even think an increase in maybe unhealthy or eating or living could be increasing this propensity for more cardiac events. So to recap our healthcare utilization findings, we don't see any consistent effects on hospitalizations or doctor's visits, but we do see some evidence of positive health spillovers for young children and an increase in cardiac events for male workers. What I don't have time to show you today, but I will mention that we did in our paper is that we looked at mortality rates. We don't see any changes in five-year mortality rates. We don't see any changes in fertility. We don't see any changes in other procedures like mammographies that are typically prescribed or, or suggested around age 40. We do see an increase in total prescriptions for male workers, again, suggesting that their, their health is being adversely affected by this increase in benefit extension, but that's driven by increases in heart medication. We've also tried to look at effects on drug and alcohol substance abuse treatment, but those findings are relatively imprecise just based on the fact that they're not very common events or um, things that appear a lot in the data. Now I wanna to move to thinking about longer term effects. I've told you a lot about what happens with our workers. They spend, when they're, when they're granted this additional nine weeks of benefits, they spend longer out of the labor force. They match, female workers match to a higher paying job. Male workers have some adverse health consequences. What happens in the longer run? To do this, we're gonna be looking at disability claims. And in Austria, disability claims are really more so referred to as disability retirement. So we're thinking of it as claiming disability and exiting the labor force because this is mostly the way that the system is set up to run in Austria. So workers can claim disability if they are in pain or disabled, although it must be certified by a medical professional. And what we find here is that when giving workers this additional nine weeks of benefits, female workers are less likely to claim disability retirement eventually, while male workers are more likely to claim disability. So here's the graph we have. And what I think is most striking here is you see that for individuals that are laid off prior to age 40, the rates of disability claim eventually, this is just sometime in the future, are pretty much stacked on top of each other for male and females. But what you see at this cutoff where the only thing is changing is the potential extension and UI benefit duration is the split where you see a stark increase in disability claims for male workers and a corresponding decrease for female workers. And if you look at the magnitudes here, uh, even though our percent change for females is higher, since male workers are already more likely to claim disability, these essentially offset each other. 
So it's about 700 workers that are more likely to eventually claim and 700 fewer workers that are likely to claim. So this doesn't have an overall change in the type and in, in the amount of benefits paid out. So to summarize our effects thus far, what we found is that by granting unemployed workers an additional nine weeks of unemployment insurance benefits, just the potential, not even forcing them to take up those benefits, leads to a reduction in opioid prescriptions and antidepressant prescriptions for female workers. It leads to short-term substitutes to less potent pain medication as they kind of reduce their opioid prescription take up over time. We don't find any effects on hospitalizations or doctor's visits, although we do find some evidence of reductions in healthcare expenditures for children under the age of six. So there does seem to be, at least based on the, the health benefits for female workers, some positive spillovers within the household as well. However, we find some adverse consequences for male workers in terms of the increase in cardiac events. And we see an increase in disability claims for male workers, but that's offset by the decrease in disability claims for female workers. Now you might be sitting there thinking, okay, I, I think I'm following what you're doing, but I'm not quite sure that you did it right. Maybe there's something else going on that could explain this result. And so I won't have time obviously to show you a bunch of robustness checks that we did, but I wanna mention them here to reassure you that we have provided a lot of evidence for our identification assumption. So we do think that these effects are meaningful and we, we do think that this is a causally, uh, a causal, I do think that we're showing you plausible causal estimates. So what we show in the paper is that there's no discontinuities and covariates at the cutoff, meaning that workers that are age 40 that are getting laid off do look similar to workers that are age 39. We've also cut out some observations around age 40. If you think there are some birthday effects that are causing our results to change. Importantly, we've also shown that there are no effects that we observe prior to job loss. So if we run our exact estimates, but don't do it at the time of job loss and look at things three months before, we don't see that unemployed workers just below the cutoff and unemployed workers just above have any differences in their health outcomes. So it does seem to suggest it's not that workers are just getting laid off after they're changing their behavior and that we're just picking up existing trends in health behavior. Importantly, we also show a lot of placebo checks. So we look at workers that don't meet the experience criterion. So we can just look at workers that haven't worked six out of the last 10 years and see if we see those same discontinuities based on age, and we find zero effects across the board for all of our health outcomes. So it does seem that those that are granted the additional nine weeks of benefits are different in some way than those that are not, only based on the fact that they're given those benefits and not based on other observables. If you are wondering about our RD specification and you wanted to see stuff for a range of bandwidths or different functional forms, we do provide that in the paper. And I'll say that the results are pretty robust and consistent across you know, narrowing in our bandwidths. So instead of just looking at ages 30 through, excuse me, ages 30 through 50, if we look at say ages 35 to 45 and so on, you can see that the estimates are pretty similar. Now I wanna spend kind of the remaining time thinking about potential mechanisms or explanations for why we're picking up these results. So I'm gonna label this as three different effects. The first is a time or a leisure effect. This is essentially thinking about why female workers might be benefiting from this extension and UI benefits, even if they're not taking up the full 39 weeks. And here, the idea is that if we allow workers to have a replacement wage for a longer period of time, it's really relaxing their time constraints and giving them more time around the household to do different chores, to invest in their children, to invest in their own health. Then we're also gonna be looking at an occupation effect. This is thinking about how much health is related to an actual worker's occupation. So is a physically demanding job the reason that you are say having to use an opioid prescription or is your job um, causing some sort of mental, uh, adverse mental health effects? And then finally, we're gonna be looking at an income effect due to the fact that we see changes in wages for female workers that are granted this extension and tend to find this better job match. 
So I'm going to start here with the time effect. We're going to use descriptive data from the 2018 Austrian census just to see what kinds of workers are, are really spending this additional time out of the labor force that might be correlated with the extension and UI benefits. So if we look at older workers, so workers over the age of 40, what we find is that unemployment duration is associated with more time spent in childcare for females, but not for male workers. So that means if we look at literally female workers that are laid off over the age of 40 and male workers that are laid off over the age of 40, male workers that are unemployed are not spending any additional time on childcare. In fact, we see that they might be spending even less time at childcare as they search for a new job. That's not true for female workers. So it does seem to suggest that there are extra demands within the household on female workers. If any of you right now are in your living rooms and you're dealing with having to homeschool and have kids around while you're even trying to watch the seminar, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Now, we also see that for females that are working, they report being more distracted at work by household duties. Male workers don't, uh, they don't report being distracted at work by the thoughts of their children or, or work that needs to be done at home. When we estimate our actual effects too, we can look at parents directly and we can look at workers that are married. And what we see is these health effects are compounded for these particular groups. So for example, female workers that have children or even have multiple children are more affected and reduce their opioid prescriptions, have higher wage gains when we allow them to have an additional nine weeks of benefits. If we look at this occupational effect, uh, this is the idea again, that there's something about the job itself that is changing behavior. So if females are, if female or male workers are now matching to a different type of occupation or a different job, that in itself could be changing their health behavior. And in fact, what we see here is that female workers, again, are matching to these less physically demanding jobs. So we don't think that our estimates for opioids are too large, given the fact that over a thousand unemployed female workers that are eligible for the extension are matching to a job without hardship. We're seeing about a reduction in opioid prescriptions by about 500. So this more than makes up for our reduction that we're seeing in the take up of, of low potency opioid prescriptions. There's no evidence that we've seen that male workers match to less physically strenuous jobs. If anything, they seem to be more likely to match to these physically demanding jobs. And so they, because we see no reduction in opioid use for men, that kind of seems to, again, support our story that there is this on the job occupational effect that's causing workers to be in pain more. Lastly, we want to look at an income effect. So again, we find these wage gains for female but not male workers as a result of being granted the additional nine weeks of benefits. And so we can again look at just in particular what kinds of workers are experiencing these biggest health effects. And we do see it to be concentrated with workers that also experience wage gains. So just splitting our sample by female workers with wage gains, female workers that don't match to a higher paying job, we see by and large biggest effects for those females that are matching to a higher paying job. So this higher paying job that they tend to have is setting them on a different trajectory for their lifetime earnings. They're more able to invest in themselves and their children. And it does seem to really affect their mental health as well. So when we look at UI benefit generosity and those workers that have the highest UI benefit payments, they also tend to have the greatest reductions in antidepressant use. This is true for both female and male workers. So any male worker that tends to have a higher UI benefit generosity or does seem to match to a higher paying job, we see reductions in antidepressant use for those workers. So again, it seems to say that income can be a driver for better mental health in some cases, along with the fact that we provide evidence that both leisure and a change in occupation can also positively affect worker health as well. So just to sum up, I wanna take a second to think through the costs and benefits here. Again, very few workers are exhausting those extra benefits, so the costs are pretty small, but the wage gains are pretty high. So we can estimate wage gains of about 42 million euros per year for female workers. We also see reductions in pain and depression with positive spillover effects for children. 
Although we do see this increase in hospitalization costs for men, that will account over our sample period of about $18 million. So still much smaller than the wage gains that we see. And I think that this can suggest how to more effectively target UI benefits. In particular, we could think about providing more resources or even more search time to mothers and low-income workers in particular, and think about how to better calculate the replacement rate or thinking about efficient amounts of UI benefit duration that could take more things into account. So we know then that the current cost and benefit calculations of either UI benefit generosity or UI benefit duration are likely understated. And I think this is especially important, not just for thinking about UI in general, but also thinking about how we best expand UI during this health pandemic. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much for everyone's time. If you have any thoughts, comments, or concerns, please feel free to ask questions. If you don't want to ask questions, you can always send me an email uh, or you can yell at me on Twitter as well. So thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Packham. Um, we have a couple of questions here. Um, Melinda, do you want to ask your questions um, first? I think you're still muted. Okay, now I'm unmuted. Okay, yep. uh, so I, I had questions um, that were prompted by thinking about childbearing effects um, and whether um, two things. One is, are the older women, the 40 plus age women, more likely to have worked six out of the past 10 years and be thus be eligible? Um, and were they less likely to have younger or, or preschool age children at home? Um, and I don't know about uh, Austrian childcare, although you did allude to that at the end that they were spending more time in, in childcare duties, the women were than the men. Yeah. No, it's a great question. I haven't dug specifically into that. Uh, what, what I can tell you is unlike Scandinavian countries, there isn't universal childcare. So it could be something that would be interesting and, and worth checking out. I can look more into that. Thanks. And I had an, another question which was somewhat related. I don't want to use up all the time, but I was really curious about the, the healthcare and the drugs that were avoided by the children under age six of those unemployed mothers who were over age 40. Um, <laughs> And in particular, I wonder, I thought it'd be interesting if you could unpack whether, for example, the children were less likely to be injured, possibly due to more supervision, or less likely to have a communicable disease, or things that might be directly attributable to the parent being at home. Um, and then I was also wanting to make sure, if you were looking at that, that you would be adjusting for the fact that the children of the older women were more likely to be on that older end of the spectrum under age six. So they'd be less likely, for example, to have um, some of those communicable diseases, possibly. Yeah, it's a good point. We don't see effects on injury. We have looked at that. And uh, I haven't looked at specific diseases, but we know that the changes in childcare expenditures are coming from reductions in curative. So it could be, that could be lumping in injury and disease, but mm -hmm. I haven't been able to really get a handle on what it is. So that's really interesting. Yeah, we can do more of that. Thanks. Another question in the q and I know we have a couple of raised hands too, so I'm gonna to try to get to you uh, and still stay on time. Um, so another question in the Q&A, what are additional inclusion or exclusion criteria for the women you're studying? Uh, for example, ethnicities represented, must they have children, what types of relationships they are in, et cetera? Oh, good question. Um, we don't have any exclusion criteria for that. So we're including all ethnicities, we're including women with children and without. So we're just looking at a local average treatment effect here. We Then when we are looking at our subgroup results, we're just looking at like separating that sample, children, yes, no. Um, but there, yeah, we don't do much with eth ethnicity or race here. It's not um, as, it's, it's not, in Upper Austria, there's not as much variation there. Great, okay. Um, Jake, will you let uh, uh, Dr. DuPont, Bill DuPont, yeah. Or, or Bruce, either one. <laughs> um, should, shall I go? Yeah, that's fine. Hi. So my thought is this, uh, it's just one perhaps small aspect of your overall findings, uh, but um, it does occur to me that 
the stress that women experience during the period of being on um, um, unemployment insurance support and seeking a new job after they've lost one, um, their stress level may be lower than men because uh, in effect, um, men feel uh, for cultural reasons and perhaps also financial reasons objectively uh, that the family is more dependent upon their employment than it is upon uh, their partners. And um, so the, the, the variable in terms of, uh, are you looking at women who are married to a, a man who has continuous employment during the period of time? Um, are you looking at single uh, family, uh, you know, single uh, parent families uh, and so forth. And, and so this, the, the stress variable is a little hard to sort out unless you can break some of the data down as the previous question, you know, by the, by the relational context of the, of the workers and the families um, that, that we're talking about. Uh, so I just wanted to ask you if there was some way to um, control for the employment, the continued employment of the spouse or the uh, um, notion that's maybe culturally there that uh, it's more important for a man to find a new job quickly uh, because the man is really responsible for the financial integrity of the family uh, kind of idea. Yeah, that's a great point. So we do look at sole earner. Well, so we have survey data on sole earners. We have information on workers, whether or not they're married. We can't match them to their spouse in the data, unfortunately. So we can't see if like their them and their spouse are both working at the same time or so on. We just know if they're married, but we do see bigger effects for married men uh, and for men with children. So this definitely supports what you're saying here. So we're seeing increases in cardiac events more so for those men and, you know, more, um, I should say a smaller reduction in antidepressant prescriptions for those workers. So it does seem to exactly support what you're suggesting there, which is that male workers feel this additional pressure and burden. And so remember, we're just comparing both sides, unemployed male workers, but one is granted additional time to search. And I think maybe that additional time to search is adding that additional pressure that you're suggesting. And so um, we do seem to have some evidence for that. Uh, I wish that we could look into that further by matching them to their spouse, but what you're saying does seem to be true in our data. Thank you. Okay, we are at 101, um, but I think the last question could be answered pretty quickly. So um, if you need to go, I completely understand. Uh, what are the pros and cons of using restrictive cubic splines as opposed to quadratic modeling of age effects? Uh, we could use other, so we've done cubic uh, in the paper. I just am showing quadratic when we were first plotting the data, we weren't using any fits at all. And we decided that most of the outcomes seem to be quadratically related. But if you do want to check out our results with other fits, you're more than, I, I'm happy to send the paper too. Yeah, well, I mean, the reason for, for suggesting this, uh, and again, you know, restricted cubic splines are considerably more flexible than, yeah. than either cubic or quadratic modeling, uh, you lose almost nothing. You know, if, if you use a three knot model, uh, you're fitting the same number of parameters as if you're fitting a quadratic model. And you know, one of the things which is really important about what you're doing are the, the breaks in your models at the 40 year time point. Right. And that's going to be where the quadratic model is going to be most sensitive to uh, to your model assumptions. Uh, so I, I would I would suggest that it's it's worth looking into. You the cost is almost is virtually nothing, um, but it, it it would increase your flexibility, um, or it it would reduce the model dependence of what you're doing. Yeah, no, it's a great suggestion. So. Yep. Thank you to everyone who. Um, participated today and who joined us. And thank you, Dr. Packham, for uh, a really interesting um, presentation. We will be back um, in the spring with our next set of speakers. Um, but until then, have a nice holiday season. Stay safe and well.
Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.